here in ITS, and I'm going to present briefly what the Varandas is, what the fellows represent to us, and a brief introduction to them, um, and then we can start. We have uh, lots of things going wrong today. Mm -hmm. Apparently, internet's not amongst us, mm -hmm. so we haven't had internet here most of the time, or partners did now also, so apparently Rio doesn't like internet today, mm -hmm. so we are offline. Um, the second thing is that we have three fellows presenting today, uh, one of them is sick. Tomorrow we would have four fellows, one fellow is sick. <laughs> we have three directors, one of the directors is sick. So apparently Rue is a really not a human place as well, with no internet, it's a really, really good day. Also, please consider that we have uh, clouds in the skies, and when we have clouds, Carioca doesn't, have, doesn't like cloudy days, mm -hmm. so we have a massive dropout. Maybe because people are sick, maybe because people don't have internet, or maybe because it's cloudy. <laughs> I really welcome you all to this veranda. Veranda is our trend setting events. They're not supposed to make lots of sense. They're supposed to try to imagine what the world will be in three years from now. So we try to talk about things that we don't exactly know what it is, but it should be important now. It's not a place to present, these are the findings from my research. This is not a place to say, this is what I have done the past 10 years but you can bring what your past, and you can bring data to say, this is what I think will be challenging from three years from now and what we should think now. So when it comes to the question session, uh, please feel free to ask any random question or futuristic questions. <laughs> they are obliged to answer. If they don't know the answer, they do as we do. They just imagine the answers, and you can imagine with them, and this is part of the game. Um, about the fellowship, what the fellowship program is to ITS. This is our second wave of fellows. So we receive around 100 applications and we select six fellows to come and spend a month with us. Uh, these fellows, uh, they are good, they are outstanding, and the reason why we do the fellowship is that it's really common for us to go abroad and be fellows. So we go to the Buckman Center, to Oxford, to UN University, but we want to bring them in. We think Brazil has lots of initiatives and ideas that should inspire others. So we bring them, uh, we connect them to our team, we connect them to the main hubs of technology and society of Brazil, Minister of Culture, Minister of Tele Telecommunications, Anatel, uh, Google, Facebook, Lab Hackers, and so on, so they can learn things from here, share themselves, and then make that works, and make more networks from Brazil to Brazil, and particularly from the Global South. Um, we spend a lot of time with them. Uh, we have brown bags where we discuss uh, key topics. We go we take them to the beach where we can discuss net neutrality with the sun. Uh, we bring them to dance, and I also bring them to help us in our own projects. So in the coming weeks, you see Brazil posts that we've written with all of them. Each fellow has a buddy, uh, and then then the buddy will co-author a blog post, and then until the end of the year, they will still be your fellows, and then we do something together. So the bananas they do is kind of a moment where we share the expertise with you. So we can share with our community what they're doing, and then you can uh, learn from them as much as we do. So uh, remember that we selected them because they were awesome, <laughs> not necessarily because they had the same topic. So please consider that about under they might talk about common topics, but somehow we have to merge them and put them together. So we might have different topics on the table. Uh, but be sure, none of them is really easy to explain what they are. So I ask them to introduce themselves, most of them can do five blog videos completely different easily. So they probably have all the five areas of ITS inside of them somehow. <laughs> so we have Yves Payal from University of Erasmus. She's originally from India. Uh, she has a, a really good... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So she would have lots to talk about similarities between here in India, we discuss sharing economics, for example, in both countries. This is one of the topics we've been discussing. Uh, she also has lots of experience in private sector and academics contributing. So she has a company herself and she works with multi stakeholder collaboration and she has lots of expertise in how to create impact from different perspectives. We also have Daniel Arnaldo. He is our Brazilian and Brazilian fellow. Uh, he speaks Portuguese, so you can speak Portuguese with him. Uh, you can pronounce his name in Portuguese and it works, but he's America from the uh, University of Washington. I used the correct preposition this time, but not Washington University, University of Washington, Seattle. And he really uh, has a long background in understanding and researching the democracy view. So the history, the main players, and the main um, ideas and struggles that come out of it. So he probably knows lots about internet regulation. You can ask him about it. Uh, who wants to go first? So by all go first. Sure. This is she has 15, 20 minutes to present to you. When it ends, you have three key questions to ask her. Then we close. We go to the second presentation. Three questions, and then the floor is open. The beer is also open. Mm -hmm. uh, we have few people. If you want beers, if you want a beer, the beer is over there. We have food over there. It's an informal place, um, so please feel free to enjoy and uh, participate as much as you like. Thank you for coming. So thanks again for coming. It's like you know, coming here in winter is like going through a snow tower storm in Canada. So you know, good for you guys. You came to survive and tell your children and grandchildren you came here in spite of it all. So fantastic. So yeah, um, thanks for the introduction. And uh, I should make up more stuff. So like I'm a spy from India, and we don't understand why the Brazilians seem to beat our ass because like you know the brick countries, you guys are like moving ahead, China's moving ahead, and India is like well politics, you know. But all right. Um, so today I'm, I'm not going to talk about my research as much as the other aspect of what I do, which is I just set up uh, and founded an organization a year ago. So I'm very excited about it. But also, it's relative, obviously, it's a young, you know, nascent organization, which is still evolving, transforming. And I'm very happy with new partnerships. So it's a very exciting stage. It's like, you know, it's like your first year of dating or romance and not marriage. So there will be the marriage at some point and divorce maybe. But for now, it's the romance stage, right? So uh, it's Catalyst Lab, uh, basically is bringing academia and business together to jointly engage the public on social issues and social questions of concern. And the way we go about it is using social media <coughs> campaigns. So we design it like what we call the seeding strategy. But you know, this sounds very abstract, so I'm going to talk a little more in detail. But let's have a backdrop of why. Why is this even necessary, right? Um, so, so let's see, like you have these two actors, right? You have big stakeholders, academia and business. So what's going on with academia? Majority of, you know, academic work does not get read. That's very disturbing, right? And academics write for acad other academics. So if you look at journal uh, templates, they are almost triangulate writing in some sense, right? Academics are trapped in jargon, and it's all about communicating to their peers behind paywalls. So it's far from being accessible. And uh, when you look at grants and the outputs from grants, uh, a lot of sometimes very exciting findings are out there, but they don't get circulated out there in the public. We often collect dust after a few policymakers and you know uh, a co-group of academic uh, peers get to know about it. And to me, that is a big loss of intellectual capital. And so this is some, I mean, it's not that academics are not driven. They want to have public outreach, but sometimes they don't even have the tools or the skill set to outreach it, you know, use that and leverage on it. Please come on. So, um, so they don't know how to leverage on that, right? And social media has been, you know, applauded as a, a phenomenal platform to celebrate and create outreach, but you don't see academic research or the key findings being circulated, you know, creating major social media campaigns. It's just not done. 
So uh, now look at the private sector. The private sector, of course, is doing a pretty good job at connecting to the consumers because they're very driven by the profit, of course. Um, maybe a decade ago, you would, uh, you know, corporations were almost litigious with social media because they weren't trusting the platform. It just seemed too democratic and out of their control, right? But now, a decade later, they have honed the appropriation for amateurization. So now they know how to appropriate amateurism. They're creating viral videos. They really are dominating social media in many ways. So, but they are, it's still a top-down communication. They're leveraging on these new technologies, but they're still marketing to consumers. And when there's a two-way communication, it's often problem solving, or, and it, it, it ends as that. So now this isn't to say that the corporation and businesses don't have a gray area where they actually genuinely want to connect with the public and want to know what the public is thinking. Because today's innovation age, you have consumers who are far more sophisticated, who are more demanding, who actually believe that corporations have responsibility to them, the public's the consumer, and they, uh, it's harder to be, you know, it, transparency is key, and it's harder to deceive or, you know, conceal, uh, conceal it much. So, um, so corporations do want to capitalize on this gray space. Sometimes for innovation purposes, they, if they know what the public's thinking, they can shape their products, their services, their platforms, and they don't mind being criticized better to be upfront and be critical now than 10 years later or 20 years later. And this way they get to shape their vision in the future, right? A lot of CEOs are under tremendous pressure to have a vision, but where are they gonna get the vision? They have to connect with the consumers. So the problem with corporations though is they don't have street credibility on social media. Anything they do will appear like marketing. So it cannot be genuine public dialogue because it's coming from them, right? So here is a very golden opportunity, uh, according to me, where the two can come together because they have one key thing in common, is they're both responsible to the public. And they owe the public and they need to communicate and connect with the public. But they're also consistently failing time and again in doing that, right? So um, this isn't just like a good idea that, oh, can't we all just, uh, it's like, uh, can't we just love each other and get along, right? It's actually, it, it, like, it recognizes a serious issue. Now, look at the current uh, stand in Europe. Um, you have this Horizon 2020. It looks like a blockbuster movie. I, I, I love the graphics. It's like something major is going to happen. <laughs> but anyway, but if you look at what they, whether it's a Dutch, a lot of grant agencies are saying, well, why is it, like, you have this parallel phenomenon. It's happening in India, too. High unemployment amongst the youth, right? And sometimes 20, 30 percent. And, and they have the degree. So, and yet you have a number of positions that are vacant. So why is that, why isn't the youth taking on those positions? And a lot of companies say, well, there's a huge disconnect between what the youth know and what kind of skill sets they have and what we are want to fulfill. Uh, so the European Union is very concerned with such a tremendous disconnect that they're coming up with grants specifically on academia uh, business partnerships, right? The other, so one could say, well, isn't that sort of neoliberal sort of agenda? But of course, one has hundred criticisms on why you shouldn't collaborate, but these are two very important stakeholders and there has to be some way one should be collaborating, right? So um, the other aspect is that, you know, valorization. It's like, okay, academia is not just, uh, you know, <coughs> intellectualism in an ivory tower. It really is about circulating knowledge and shaping society and allowing society to think with it, right? You have a sense of responsibility. So the, the grants and the European agents are saying, well, we need knowledge to be circulated and needs to become valorized. That's a buzzword, at least in Holland, is that it needs to go out into the public in ways which are accessible, engaging, and communicative. So you have that momentum in the larger umbrella. So capitalist is, that's where I got this idea because I was thinking, well, I'm tired of like, you know, all these hundred reasons why academics won't do it because of course you're perceived as a sellout, you're lacking in objectivity, right? Uh, that, oh, if you collaborate, it'll taint your research. 
but that should not stop you because there are strategies. As long as you're aware of that, and companies, of course, they could be perceived as whitewashing and you know superficial PR. But going beyond it, that's where we're coming in is that we'd like to create this meaningful bridge and bring in other stakeholders and create a, a campaign. So we do have a principle is that we ask that we work with businesses and other organizations. We say we need a social question or issue which is open-ended and you cannot control the answers. We will try to do as much of inclusion as possible, which means coming, getting voices from very diverse sectors of society. And uh, in return, you have to be prepared for the kind of answer. They may hate it. It, it can't be, a, yeah, it, it, it needs to be an open-ended question, right? Uh, some are much more narrow, some are broader. So these are some of the people we've been working with. Uh, so for example, uh, museum folk farm, uh, museums in general, and we have a, uh, you know, we find a number in the last few years we've been approached by a number of museums across board, and even our board is also working on it. It's all about the future of museums. And here's the fact is majority of people who go to museums are white, upper-class educators. And um, in post-colonial context, like India and Brazil, 98% of people in Brazil have never stepped foot in a museum. India is similar. You know, the practice of going to the museum in India is, is looked upon as something which is post-colonial, like it is for the other. It's not. So on the other hand, say, for example, Google Art Project wasn't perceived as a museum thing. It was an entertainment space. People, so online spaces have the ability to transform the meaning of what constitutes a museum and may even encourage people to go to these spaces. So um, this is something of, of serious concern. I just went to uh, the Museum Hong Kong uh, organized a symposia where we were speaking about it. Was, what is the future of museum in this age where majority of it is also older people? How do we get the youth engaged, involved, and interested? And how does this become a, a space that means something to them? Right, so we are uh, in the process of creating a social media campaign where, which allows, takes exhibits and makes it fun and engaging. I mean, think about simple rule. You cannot use a mobile in, you know, in the museum. And museums are rethinking these sort of old policies. Why, why can't you? What constitutes as a sacred space, right? Uh, is it how irreverent is it? So these are the kinds of questions. You have General Electric, which has a different kind of issue. They, uh, the question they had is you have medical diagnostic software and this whole idea of Internet of Things or the industrial Internet. They're like, yes, but how do the elderly actually use these? I mean, in, in what sense do these technologies make sense to them? Does it really empower them or does it feel, do they feel overwhelmed and debilitated? with us. So they wanted to know what, how is the day-to-day -day use and is it really meaningful in some ways for the elderly? Or do they, yeah, so, and do they have intermediaries between that? And so this is for product innovation and improvement. So I'm going to talk about um, a project we just finished with Dutch Brewers, um, uh, which is, uh, yeah, the, we just, yeah, about a month ago we wrapped up and uh, basically the Dutch Brewer Association came up to us and said, okay, um, it's a very, we have a trivial, it may seem like a trivial question, but it's a question we've always been, we've been asking for decades and we've never, never really gone there. So here's the thing, they have non-alcohol beer. They never have marketed or promoted it amongst the late teens of 16 to 18. It was, it's just not done because they be looked upon as sharks, as if they're trying to encourage, you know, uh, you to drink alcohol. It's a pathway to alcoholism. So uh, their target market is an older group. That said, they had a lobby of parents who came up to them and actually made them rethink this. They said, why aren't you promoting non-alcohol beer amongst youth? Because this is your s social responsibility. Because you need to make it cool to them because that way they don't drink alcohol and even religious groups came up to them. So they were quite surprised by that because they weren't expecting, they were used to this, they had formulated and uh, what the public actually is supposed to think. So they said, you know, it may seem, what we want to know is this, uh, do parents really want us to promote it? And do they see this as an act of social responsibility? Is this a genuine alternative for you? 
So they were hesitant, but they said, so let's try it. And they were really kind of very nervous working on this because they didn't want to see. So it was very hush hush, you know. And but they, because they were very careful, they were very nervous of getting into it. So we took it on and we came up with a competition. So. Uh, it started off with like uh, a competition so proposing this question and asking our students, which was our 175 students, to come up with a pitch. And the winner, the top three, would get prizes. <coughs> and the pitches were in video form, which I would show you, but there's no internet. <laughs> so you have to just imagine, but it was really fun pitches of very different ideas of how, and it was underlined that you cannot be marketing it. You have to be building a. It has to be building awareness, and half the pitches were thrown out because students were uh, really struggling. It is a very hard thing to not market, right? So that's our default mechanism. So out of it, we chose three proposals. Uh, one, and I will talk about it. One was a hidden camera idea, which is a hook. Another is a persona, and third is a school debate. And I'll tell you more about this. So our campaign was called Lekha Nipta, which is in Dutch, which means it's hard to translate, but it's like sober and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Really bad translation. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what we did was, okay, so the persona's idea was from students, and that persona's idea is saying, look, we need to understand the different arguments from different groups, right, of society. Because is it, firstly, they started a question, is it this binary of objecting to it because of, you know, is it an ethical or unethical thing. And so they, what we did was at the start is we sent our research team of a group of students to very diverse neighborhoods in Holland uh, of different economic class and also religious groups. So we selected neighborhoods. So we really employed sort of research skills and said each one would do 50 interviews with random people on the street in those communities. I mean, it wasn't like meant to be a scientific study, but the idea is to get 50 voices from each. So we had about 350 responses from our little team from very diverse neighborhoods, and we got patterns. Because we found, we like sort of collated all the data, and we, because we're designing a poll, right, to then put it online. But how do we design the poll is first by understanding, getting a sense of how are people thinking. And we found there were five clear themes. People talked in terms of trust. And they were often flipped. We heard both arguments by a variety of people. <coughs> so trust is one. Is alcohol free beer really alcohol free? If really it's zero points, then I have no problem. So people were sort of skeptical. I don't really believe, firstly, it's not alcohol. So you say it is, but it's not. And the others are like, oh yeah, but if it's alcohol free, of course it should be. And I totally trust that. So we had both ends. So that was a theme on trust. Ethics, people felt very passionate about, no, this is completely a marketing ploy. It's like, you know, sweet, like the, the uh, parallel did with like the sweet, like, I don't know if you guys had the candy cigarettes, you know, as kids, but it's <laughs> so wrong. I think it's banned in many colors, but sometimes it's still seen around. But, and then, yeah, you get kids hooked into that, and then you get the real cigarette. So they felt it unethical, but some said non-alcoholic beer should not be marketed to you at all because it is a step to drinking alcoholic beer. And then you got the other end of it saying, no, that's the least the Dutch brewers can do is get them onto making non-alcoholic beer cool so they can continue with this because it's healthier. So, and the third was health. Just gave my kids their first non-alcoholic beer. Good thing, it's so much better for their brains than alcohol beer. So these are actual quotes from parents around these different communities, social. Uh, I think that children in the age 16 to 18 are fond of drinking beer, so if it's 0% uh, alcohol beer and will be promoted as beer, they feel like they belong to the cool people who can drink beer. So parents are like, listen, I know my kids. They want to be cool, that's their age, but you need to make it sexier. So you can understand the dilemma, right, for a Dutch bros. Like, you're telling me to make it sexy. On the other hand, you tell me if I do that, I'm like evil. So what is it, right? And then the fifth is taste. It's like they, a number of them didn't even think about these issues. They're like, whatever, these are not our concerns. It's about taste. Kids won't like it because it tastes like crap. So, you know, and then some said, no, no, actually, it's, you know, it depends on which, if it's a home brewery or now because a lot of breweries are coming up, like local breweries, it's become cooler and it tastes nicer. And so 
that was an issue on taste, actually, as a way to vote. So we create, came up with these themes and then came up with an online poll. But who loves taking surveys, right? Nobody. How do you put something like that on Facebook and say, hey, do you want to take a survey for some random company you don't care about? You know, do it. Or, so basically, we need to have a hook. So we basically created these personas. We um, also released little competitions artists, and they came up, uh, and they came, the winner came up to the contract, and they got these personas. So this is like trust and social. So we created this bottle, health. So each one had was an avatar, and it says find out. Basically, it became a Facebook thing. You want to know what kind of persona you are? You, you know, like an avatar. You know, here's click this to find out. So it's nothing to do with the survey, and whatever you relate to uh, is like you could click and share it with your friends. So it was more like, what kind of person are you? Like trending into the whole social media aspect, and it is secondary and immaterial in what they're actually doing, right? So we have actually, in two weeks, we got a result of 375 with no advertising, really, zero. Uh, 300, we just put it on online on the website and put it out there. So. But uh, actually, I'll have to back, uh, take a back thing. And for people to get to that is they needed a hook, right? So OK, so we designed the poll. It's on the website. But how do we get people to click on that on Facebook? So they need to be a hook before it goes to the poll. And then the poll. So we needed two hooks just to play it safe. So another idea, which so that was the second idea which won in the competition was a hidden camera video, which I think is so much fun to watch. But uh, anyway, which is actually, uh, the idea was, OK, so you, you want to have a spoof. So the, uh, the winning group said, let's put hidden cameras in a park, and let's have three very young-looking kids holding bottles of beer and covering it so like, oh, it's non-alcohol, but you can't see it, and then going up to random strangers and say, hey, do you have a bottle opener? And seeing if they react to ask them questions, and they have a mic, so it will record their reactions. And that way, it's like, OK, you get a sense of, and walk up to very different groups, whether they're families, they're a couple, and see what they say. And so and then the, the, it translated to, uh, this was the video in the end. These were the child actors. So we went to Wondell Club. We went to different safari park in Amsterdam. We tried different parks. And we actually did that in camera. And it was very funny because, so uh, you can watch, it, it's in Dutch, but basically the video was these kids. We chose them to look very young and innocent. We had to debate, like, have to be a young girl and two boys because people feel more protective. And the girl should ask because she has this innocent, sweet voice, you know. And uh, they looked like they were kind of getting in a naughty space or something. But they went and asked. And it was really funny because the reactions were, Oh yeah, okay. You I don't have an opener, but I know how you can get it. You can go here, and you can do this. And then they were asking, so there was a lot of helping to get them to open the alcohol. And then one father with a kid, who's in the next clip, is you know basically he, he has his child in the pram, and he's like, hang on. He he had an opener, and he's over. Hang on, this is non-alcohol. What are you drinking non-alcohol here for? <laughs> and this is a parent, right? And so it says. So the video is like. Uh, you know, a Dutch, uh, yeah, a Dutch parent don't care about like so. Click here or something is like they, we had two different bylines. Uh, the youth, dr you know, underage children drinking alcohol in the park and Dutch don't care. Question, uh, you know, click and find out. And so, and then we had like face to you know head-on interviews of people, and people were getting all sort of passionate because once you started to get them to think that, yeah, but. I don't know, aren't you too young? Or the other one's like, yeah, but you know, if you're a year older, it would be cool. And then they started to argue, and so the whole video clip, and says, if you want to, if you have an opinion, click here, which went to the poll. So, and then find out what kind of persona are you. So that's how we link the second project. So, all right, so last is that you to create a social media campaign, I think one of the hardest things is you can't just create open platform like, oh, I have a Twitter account or a Facebook account. It doesn't work because you have to have a strategy. You have to have a seeding strategy which has a starter end point. You need to have a narrative. You need to have like different stages. So like, for example, Twitter. And how do you maintain objectivity? It's very difficult. 
So what we did was we created like Twitter debates. So of each one had their own avatar, had their own Twitter account. And so they, like, the health avatar says, just gave my kids their first non-alcoholic beer. It's a good thing. It's so much better for their brains. But then trust says, really sure? I heard that non-alcoholic beer sometimes still contains some alcohol. Don't believe everything commercials say. So we're playing devil's advocate. Ethics saying, oh, alcohol, I know. What if the taste of non-alcohol encourages them, them to drink alcohol beer? So you can see what I mean. In the end, we were the expert out there. And we said, all right, you all have a good point. People on Twitter, what do you think? So we, we had these sort of strategies. Um, we created memes. So we had genres. We had divided our tweets. We pre-created our tweets and our Facebook posts into different. So we had promotional. We had what we call the wisdom on Wednesdays. I won't pronounce that, uh, which is basically each week we, we had an educational thing about the non-alcohol beer so people could make a more educated decision. Competition challenge, you know, about winning something. Question of the week, you can ask the expert and debates, right? Like this, and and these sort of like uh, little memes on Facebook of yes and no, and we would have provoking challenges. But this is what I mean by seeding strategies. So just to wrap up, these are some of the projects we're working on, and we're looking forward to partnering. Is like one of the things I'm very excited about is terms and conditions. Is you know how many of you guys you know that majority of people click on it because they feel like they're no choice they have to so they can get the product. But what was more disturbing that I found was uh, a recent study revealed that majority of people thought that was to protect them, not the not the company. They thought it was there. It was for them, and that's because and so these perceptions are really disturbing. So what? I'm uh, working in collaboration with uh, a wonderful fellow here, hopefully, and other groups. So is that we want to dummify and like extract the key uh, co points of the contract of terms and conditions, which is like say 75 pages sometimes, and we're going to create stop motion animation like terms and conditions for dummy and a channel for all the different uh, you know. Company. So that could be a very cool, it's like part of the public valorization and outreach. So a number of different, like about digital cities and urban cities, what does your future city look like? To having a sort of, you know, people are having a lot of discussion on open access and saying, okay, this is all about, there's a lot of debate about open access in the right one, I won't go into it, but why not like think differently and say, okay, screw that, this debate will take a long time. What about taking the already published journal articles and creating social media output, like taking the actual main points of it and transforming it into multimedia you know, products? There is right now no law or there's no copyright on that, right? And in fact, if you look at what's happening in the publication industry, they're just waking up to this. I just got requested by Sage and a number of co companies to say, hey, do you want to create a video of your publication? Because we find users want that. We want to offer it for free. So these guys want to charge for it. But they're waking up now, and we still have, there is no law. So this is what we want to do. It's really produce engaging content of already published uh, material. So yeah, these are some of the things that I'm excited to talk more. But you can check us out on the website. And thank you. Okay, I open up for two or three quick questions. Um, do you want to go first or do you want to do it both together? Any quick questions? Raise the hand. Down. So intimidating. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we wait for the. Anyway, I think we present right. and then we do a group together. I do have questions. <laughs> we don't have no alcohol beer. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a sponsor event.
application that takes the, the blue out of your screen at night. It's good for working at night. strategies for societies in transition and the focus of, uh, of our research is, is mostly on information literacy and developing curriculums for communities not only in Myanmar but potentially other places and that's that creates a lot of interesting connections to what's going on here in Brazil and favelas and universities and schools and libraries in different contexts where people are trying to learn about um, information, informational topics, internet, um, really to access the, the society that is developing online and, and is really affecting society um, as a whole and, and, and our reality is now changing. And people are just coming to terms with how to, how to grasp that and, and how to include a, a larger number of people in those concepts. And Myanmar is really interesting, it's also called Burma, for, for a number of reasons that I'm going to talk about. So three main things coming out of this, this discussion that, that I want to kind of get at. And, and the first one is just talking about Myanmar and why is that special? What is, what is its history? The second one is looking at information literacy as a concept that a lot of people talk about digital literacy, information literacy, media literacy in different contexts. What does that mean? And the third thing is talking about what is our project doing and what does that do to actually bring these concepts to people in a place that, that really needs it. Um, our project is uh, basically the university is, is managing the project. We have support from the US Agency for International Development and Microsoft as well as the Gates Foundation which is uh, essentially Bill Gates' um, philanthropic organization that does a lot of work with, uh, with libraries and, and that's our main interest. Um, I do work both with the International Studies Department of my school and with the uh, Information School, which is an information science department. It's actually the oldest um, information or library science uh, department in the United States. Um, so it has a lot of history there looking at information that really predates the kind of uh, media and online information systems that the people associate with the concept of information now where you think about ITS and it's you know it's it's a modern internet online organization but really the concept of information and information literacy predates the information age so looking at, at Myanmar in particular is, is an interesting place because they're really a, a place that, that comes from somewhere that's much older and and actually exists in a space that is just beginning to come into the online world and is really a blank slate, a, a tabula rasa for a lot of the concepts that we talk about here at ITS and, and in Brazil, but also in, in, the, uh, in the academic community about what is information, how do people learn about these things, about computers, about online systems. Um, Myanmar was a dictatorship for over 50 years, um, starting roughly after World War II. There was a brief period of democracy. Um, after the British left, they ruled the country for you know, over 50 or 60 years. And basically, the, there was a brief period of democracy, and then the original ruler, Aung San, was overthrown. And uh, the dictatorship came into place that was very similar in a lot of ways to, to North Korea in that it was a pretty, um, a pretty rigid dictatorship, somewhat socialistic, but it was basically a military junta that was in control of the country. And, and this is a pretty large country too, it's right next to Thailand, it's about 50 million people. Um, 
And at the same time, it's, it's ethnically diverse. There are over 135 ethnicities in the country, and they set up spaces within the country after the war that they defended and tried to create autonomous zones, and this became um, essentially civil conflicts that were ongoing throughout the dictatorship. Um, there, there were two ongoing central wars, and then there was ethnic conflict in, in the western part of the country near Bangladesh that you probably heard about in the news some, um, looking at the Rohingya people that uh, are Muslim and often fought against the regime in various ways, but have been persecuted up until the present day. And at the same time, um, looking at Myanmar as a as a as a political institution, there were human rights abuses. There was no opposition, and as an information space, there was very little access to information. There was no independent media. There was no um, there were no ability to access the internet. Certainly, there was no you, to own a fax machine. You had to essentially get the approval of the government, um, and so this was a very rigid, you know, tightly defined space with you know some some conflict within the country, um, but basically less than 1% of the people had any sort of access to the internet, to uh, you know, international telephones, um, or to independent media. And at the same time, um, the, the country was really seen in the outside world as kind of a basket case, and kind of like a North Korean-like space where you didn't have access to um, the outside world, and you didn't really see any, any major effort for change there. Aung Sung's daughter is probably the most famous Burmese person internationally, Aung Sung Suu Kyi. Um, she's a kind of Nelson Mandela-like figure. She was uh, under house arrest for over 20 years uh, since the original democracy protests came around in the late, late 80s and 90s. There was a brief opening. They were going to allow for elections, but when it became apparent that her party, the National League for Democracy, was going to win, they basically annulled them, threw her back in jail, and under house arrest, she remained there for you know, the next 15 years. And it was a very tightly controlled system. But around 2010, they, the, the regime somehow internally came to the conclusion that economically or politically or whatever the, the calculation was, that they should open. And so this led to a watershed change. And in 2011, they released Aung San Suu Kyi. Um, they said they would allow for free and fair elections when just a year before they'd been totally controlled by the regime. And they also said that they were going to relax the media laws. And so the first independent newspapers came online. Seven Day Journal is probably the most, the most famous Burmese paper domestically, but also the BBC was allowed in the country again. Radio Free Asia, CNN, international correspondents came back to the country. And so you, you were starting to see a very it was a kind of information revolution already in, in the process. But at the same time, you had mobile networks coming online. It was the government always tightly controlling the telephone system, and it, much like they did here in Brazil, where you had the government running the, the telephone system for years. But in that case, it was still a dictatorship. And it, basically, to have a phone, you had to be an approved person. And now, all of a sudden, they were saying they were going to let in two new entrants from, from foreign companies, and they were going to allow them to build out cell phone networks that anyone could access. And so you've basically seen this watershed and, and change in terms of the way that the, the information environment in the country, along with the political and the economic system, has changed. But at the same time, you have a population that's very much stuck in the dictatorship. They haven't had the education. They haven't had the experience with independent media. They don't know how to use computers or to use cell phones. They haven't been taught any of these things, and all of a sudden now, it's open to them. So you're seeing not only an independent media, but one of the most free internets in the world. Um, it, uh, the government basically opened it up and now doesn't have a system in place to control it. So even compared to their neighbors, um, I would say they're they're really they're they're really on on top of uh, the, the the independent in information system game just because they have so little ability to, to control the environment. Um, so you see pictures like what, what I'm trying to to get at here is that this is a picture from on top of, of Mandalay Hill, which is one of the more famous temples in, in Mandalay, which was the old imperial city before. Um, the British came and, and took over and relocated the capital to Yangon 
which is down south. And you can see here these are old temples, but at the same time you're seeing these things start to sprout up everywhere, the cell phone towers that, that are bringing information to people in totally new ways. And, and you've seen the literacy rates go from, or sorry, the, the internet um, and, and cell phone adoption rates going from around 1 or 2% in 2010 to now nearly 50%. And those people are starting to get access to Facebook, they're starting to get access to uh, the internet in different ways, Wikipedia, SMS systems, and there's this, this huge change in the way that, that people are interacting, and, and they're starting to be included in these, in these discussions about um, global political topics, about domestic political topics, but they don't have the facilities to, to process it because they haven't learned about these different concepts in different ways. Um, in terms of how to filter for information, how to understand where different perspectives are coming from, how to, how to cite things, how to look at information as something that, that is very much controlled, and they, they'll understand maybe propaganda because that's what the regime gave them, but they won't have an understanding of what is, what is free and independent media entirely. In, in a lot of cases, really interestingly, they don't even have words for these things. Privacy is a concept. I, I've asked Burmese, um, nationals to give me a word for privacy in their language and it simply doesn't exist. And actually you, you can see this replicated in other, uh, other uh, Southeast Asian environments where there, there just isn't a word there. And when you think about it, with, with that kind of history, when they've been in dictatorship, when they've been in um, years of, it, of, of imperial rule and you know are often living in, in collective societies for, for great amounts of time, they want to develop concepts like that. So how do you talk about that and, and other concepts like, like security online that are really esoteric and difficult to get at even for someone who, who has that experience? So that starts to get at, at concepts like what, what is info, information literacy as, as a concept and as, as an idea. And in some ways, you, you can think about it in a way that internet literacy is practiced in terms of learning about how to use specific devices, how to use uh, different technologies, how to use your phone, how to use email, how to use different um, technological systems. But at the same time, it, it really comes from a number of different places that I think is, is honestly best represented by this kind of uh, this graph that, that shows you that information literacy as a property is really uh, a number of different literacies working together. You have media literacy that looks at you know, how you were able to read media in terms of newspaper, television, online media, and, and be able to filter for understanding what kind of perspective you're, you're looking at. And then you have digital literacy, and you know, being able to use digital media in, in the same kind of way and be able to filter it. And, and not only to be able to read it, but, but to create it. And then at the same time you have the ICT literacy, the, the ability to use the technology and, and to use the, the systems that are developed. This is more of the traditional skills where you're able to build a, a website or an application um, or an email system or you know, really any sort of a basic kind of IT skill that is taught. Um, and, and this all kind of comes together as a, a, a more abstract concept of information literacy as a property where you're dealing with all these different competencies and literacies put together. So you're dealing with skills, but you're also dealing with knowledge, which is a, a more conceptual property. And you're also dealing with attitudes towards the technology and, and looking at these all, all together. Th this comes from a paper from the European Union that developed a program called uh, the Digital Competency Framework which tried to synthesize a number of different um, information literacy curriculums that look at addressing different kind of communities and, and addressing these questions in terms of being able to, to develop curriculums and, and syllabi for teaching about these concepts. Um, and there, there are a number of others, but what I found was interesting not only about this one, but the other ones that they, they provided and that we found in our, in our, uh, in our analysis and our review was that there, there weren't a lot targeted specifically at these kind of situations. Low infrastructure, um, low power, um, low bandwidth, um, you know, weak institutions, democratic or otherwise, uh, that, that are really giving you the kind of background that you would expect. They're, they're designed more for the European context or for the 
North American context where people have laptops and are not dealing with cell phones, where people have access to power 24 hours a day, where people have been in school for you know 10 or 15 years and, and have all this background in terms of reading and knowledge and, and basic literacy itself. Um, the, the concept of being able to create content as being equally valued as being able to read it. Um, so these are all important things that, that come together in the formation of literacy as a concept. And kind of the topic of today is looking at inclusion in different ways. Th this is a really key way of, of including people in, in societies and building societies, not only in Myanmar, but in other contexts, in Brazil certainly, um, but in, in the United States, in, you know, really any country in the world to build a society today, you have to equip people with tools that allow them to access um, not only, you know, education and um, news media and uh, communicate with their peers, but also allows them to access services and um, work with infrastructure and, and work within larger systems and, and understand what, what they're doing in those kind of larger systems, whether it's health or whether it's education, transportation, otherwise. So we're developing um, systems for dealing with people and, and teaching with, with about information literacy as a concept in, in, in Myanmar, basically because it is this blank slate where no one is, is, is really stepped in to talk about how these people are gonna integrate into the global society and, and also how they're gonna be able to, to build these democratic institutions and economic systems and um, basically uh, transform themselves in the way that they think they're going to be able to do um, in, in all these different ways in a very short space of time and it's going to depend a lot upon um, building online institutions just the same as offline ones. Um, so that was a lot of the impetus that came for, for creating this project and working with these different institutions within Myanmar. Um, one of our really um, key points was, was to develop networks and partners within the country that would be able to work with us in, in developing information literacy curriculums for people in libraries and NGOs, um, but also a network of people within the society that is working with the different sectors, um, not only government and business, but in civil society and uh, the nascent uh, technical and academic community that has really been you know, incredibly um, discriminated against and, and, uh, and, and stifled for over 60 years. I, I was in Mandalay in this, down below in the, in the valley there at their university and I sat in on the first political science class in 60 years. And you know, there was half the political class of, of Mandalay sitting in this class discussing um, what would happen when the dictatorship uh, released power with the elections that are coming in October. And it's a really incredible thing to talk to people in the day-to-day, -day, understanding about what they're, what they're going through and what their concerns are, but also how they're beginning to access these concepts in terms of democracy, in terms of um, talking about you know, how to build a, a just economic system or a new ju judicial system. Um, these are new things and they need tools for for ways to talk about this, and they need to build networks of people that are able and capable of addressing these problems. So our basic approach is to develop strategies both for the people at the, the top of the pyramid that are dealing with these problems and, and have to find answers immediately in terms of they're running an NGO and they want to do election monitoring or they want to talk about political parties in different contexts or they're running a government agency and they need to start to develop a communication strategy. So you need to think about information and information management as a, as a, as a high level problem in developing project management skills to deal with that, right? That's a very high level of information literacy as a concept, right? You're developing skills to, to transmit your ideas to other people through social media or um, develop large scale systems uh, to, to handle the amount of data you're dealing with as a government institution or a business or an NGO. And then at the same time, we're working with uh, our NGO partners there with their library networks and people who are just starting to get the internet and are just starting to deal with the concept that they want to access Facebook, but they also want to, in their daily lives, integrate these tools and these systems 
and, and also have a greater understanding of the larger issues that are involved. Facebook there is a, a huge, a huge deal. People have a concept of Facebook before they even have an idea of what the internet is. Um, basically, there's this really interesting poll that was done by, uh, it was a, a Southeast Asian NGO looking at um, information um, adoption and penetration in different ways. And it asked the question basically, whether you use the internet and, or whether you use Facebook. And you can see this is not only in, in Myanmar, but in a, a host of other Asian, uh, Southeast Asian contexts, people were asked, do you use the internet? And you know, in Myanmar, that, that roughly tracks with what the International Telecommunications Union said, around 1% of people have internet access at this stage in the country, which is one of the lowest in the world. But when they were asked whether they used Facebook, four times the amount of people responded that they used Facebook and understood what that was. So you, you have right there a basic information literacy concept, right, that you need to talk to people about in different ways. What is the internet and what is Facebook and how do they interact and where is the line, right? That, that's a pretty clear example and that's one that we try to get at in, in, our, in, in our curriculum and in our syllabi and in, in our material. But at the same time, we're, we're trapped in this system because we have to use Facebook as a tool for teaching people. And you have to use it in, in ways that, that access, um, that, that give them access to the greater internet, but also give them means of communicating with each other and connecting with what they're actually going to be using it for. Because at the same time, when you see what, what that kind of usage rate describes, the whole internet and informational economy within the country is is basically running on Facebook. When you have a business, you don't create a website, you create a Facebook page. When you're a government agency or you're the president, you have a Facebook account, you don't have a website, and that's what gets updated. And you're seeing this in a, in a number of different contexts, but it's basically changing the way people interact. So to try to, to address that and, to, and to talk a little bit about um, what are the differences? Why should you care about this? Um, you know, what is the greater internet as a concept to someone who's just beginning to get a sense of what what uh, independent media is, or what uh, you know the ability to use a use a cell phone is, and how that works? You have to do that all at once. You have to do all those literacies that I showed you earlier all at once. So, so how do you get to that? So we're working on creating a network of, of people. We, we have fellows. Um, within these different aspects of society, librarians, journalists, government people, um, businessmen um, that work with information as, as a property, whether they're in the ministry addressing communications or information issues, whether they're journalists who are talking about higher level tech issues, um, whether they're bloggers that are you know, respected by their communities, and, and whether they're librarians that are working with, with people in different contexts. Um, and, and talking to them about their strategy for developing higher level information ideas. Um, and then at the same time, working with them to develop a curriculum that then they can go and take to their library and their NGO and, and, their, uh, and, and their government agency and talk to people about these problems and about thinking through the different um, conceptual ideas that, that make up information literacy as a concept. Um, we basically came together working with them around the, the European Union's framework because it, it really addresses the core competencies, I think, very consistently. You have uh, communication as an ability, so you're able to interact with people in different ways and, and assess what, what they're communicating with you. You have information as a, as a core competency that looks at how you evaluate information, search for it, filter it, um, and, and access it in different ways. Um, and then you have content creation. Again, it, like literacy is a concept, just the basic literacy. You want to be able to write as well as you, you're able to read, and, and that has value. And especially in contexts where you're dealing with people working with Facebook, which is a very, um, very consumptive uh, advertising-based system where it encourages you to consume more than you produce. Um, you want to address that issue specifically in different ways. And, and also you want to look at safety and security as an issue, so traditional security issues, privacy as a concept, um, being able to secure your data, being able to talk about that, but also safety in terms of using devices in ways that are healthy. Um, and then finally, the larger 
conceptual problem solving idea which is the hardest thing of all to teach but to bring it all together and and to, and to give people problems that they can address using these different competencies and tools using their ability to filter information and their ability to communicate with others and collaborate to construct new ideas all these things are important and come together in developing the, the curriculum that we basically created with our partners translated to Burmese and have allowed them to apply in different modular ways that, that they can work with in their specific communities, um, addressing problems that are important to people depending on what their profession is, what their interests are, what their community and their network is like, and what their abilities are, whether technical or personal. Um, and finally, um, we're, we're looking to, to bring this community um, both more access to these ideas in terms of publishing our curriculum online, um, and, and developing those resources with them online. But then also in September we'll be convening um, an information symposium in, uh, in Yangon with, uh, with people within the government and different sectors of society to talk about these issues um, as they're developing. And we'll be having this election in 2015. It'll be the first free and fair election in 50 years. Um, and, and it's really going to continue to change uh, a society that is in an incredible transition as it is. So it's been an exciting project, but I really think um, it, it's a, it's an interesting place to look at because this tabula rasa provides a, a really incredible test bed for developing these ideas and, and really great potential. Because if we if we don't address these problems in, in, in contexts like Myanmar, um, not only will they have troubles, but in places like here in Brazil, where you're struggling with developing ideas for a, an information society where people are able to collaborate with the government on, on law, where, where people are trying to bring net neutrality as a concept within the Constitution and allow people to address informational problems in their day-to-day -day lives and include more people in these processes and, and these ideas in, in different sectors of society places where you don't have a lot of access and you don't have a lot of basic literacy of any kind, whether information, media, digital, ICT, or otherwise. So this is important not only in Myanmar, but, but in a lot of other contexts, and I think really touches on a lot of issues around building stronger societies in, in the modern world. Um, so I'm really hopeful that, that we'll be able to develop research um, around the ideas that, that we've developed in Myanmar so that we can then bring our curriculum to other contexts, develop for those contexts, and, and, and work with communities in different ways. So I'm really eager to get uh, some feedback from you guys. I know some of you work on these concepts as well in different ways, but I'd like to hear more about what people have heard about working in Brazil, talking about these concepts in different ways, because it's, a, it's an interest of mine, and uh, I look forward to it. So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. So the floor is open for questions. Um, trust any of the two. Trust both of them. None of them. I don't buy them. Questions? Oh, a lay question. They don't have a technology background, so they're coming from an academic uh, background. but. Um, since the theme was inclusion, I guess both of my questions relate in some way to inclusion of both of what you were presenting. Um, for Dan, I was, I mean, when I think about Burma and Myanmar, I think about the ethnic cleansing there, and I just wondered how you could speak to uh, the, you know, what your experience was in understanding connections between that and internet, you know, the way in which um, some parts of the population might not still be getting access to the internet, or if there's ways in which the internet is maybe mobilizing human rights campaigns in ways there, I don't know, or if there's a surveillance mechanism in place to the internet, um, I'm just curious about that. And for Payal, um, I um, was curious about how much um, academics themselves could drive initiatives with your group. I mean, it was really interesting to learn about the ways in which you are, these uh, companies are drawing on the public in a collaborative way to sort of, but I was curious about, because in the beginning you've had the ivory tower, I was curious about the role of academics more generally in steering some of these initiatives, and if I could see it a little bit too with the um, making a digital you know, narrative or something about a book or an article, but I was curious if you could say more. 
<laughs> I guess I'll start. No. Wow, is this even on before? I think it's on. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, I'll blow the surprise. We know this was offline, but we didn't want to interrupt, so we pretended it was online. Now we cannot pretend anymore, so yeah. <laughs> But yeah, the meat's on now. It's on now, it's hot. But the recording is fine. <laughs> the recording is good. Okay. Yeah, they have a special recorder with that as well. All right, good to know. Um, so, I was wondering if it's not a little quiet. <laughs> now it's going to be weird to hear my own voice through again. Uh, uh, you can just not do it. Yeah. Okay. Well. It's freedom. It's like freedom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, let's bring the new technology to the new patient. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, the ring is a really interesting component of the whole problem because, uh, I mean, the whole problem and, and solution in some ways, just because um, they're, they're, you know, one of the most persecuted groups within the country. Um, they're basically a Muslim minority within a extremely Buddhist uh, society. There's some Christians in certain parts of the country, but I think it's over 90% uh, Buddhist. And yeah, they were persecuted, uh, you know, going back to the original, uh, the, the imperial Burmese regime. But um, under the English, they were somewhat, uh, somewhat legalized because uh, they allowed for a large amount of Indian immigration uh, from areas of, of Bangladesh to encourage the imperial uh, system. But um, basically, uh, you know, now we're under extreme stress because, uh, you know, the government doesn't really consider them legal and uh, is trying to minimize them. They're, they're called Bengalis, they're called uh, Bangladeshis, uh, illegal immigrants in various contexts. And um, actually, social media has become a tool, um, some for organizing human rights campaigns, but also for inflaming. Um, ethnic passions, and there have been a lot of campaigns where Buddhist monks have gone online and, and blown up by incidents of uh, you know rape or you know attacks on communities, and have, have created basically riots within these communities and pushed people out, and that's I think creating a lot of uh, problems within those communities because people don't have these skills to be able to filter and, and, and work with the, the information and where it's coming from to be able to understand. And, and evaluate what, what they're talking about. Um, and then at the same time, you're seeing actual people coming from different places from outside of the country, uh, Indonesia in particular, which is a Muslim minority nation, um, or Muslim majority nation rather. Um, you've seen uh, after these kind of attacks or where the government has not done enough to protect people, you've seen um, hackers from Indonesia and other places going and attacking government ministries and taking websites offline. Um, so you're seeing a really interesting dynamic, but I do think you know what we're trying to do is is partly to address this this kind of issue where I think you know you have a real lack of understanding uh, about you know the kind of information that people are getting about these kind of things where people are being inflamed in different ways. Um, people are being attacked in different contexts and there isn't enough information about how it's being organized. Um, and, and so, you know, I think this is, this is really, you know, going to become a fundamental problem that, that they're going to have to continue to deal with as they develop a democratic system and, and talk about these ideas and develop, you know, new ways of thinking about how to develop a community and a nation that's really been based on, you know, the Burmese majority controlling um, controlling the society, controlling the government, and not allowing not only the Rohingya, but the Karen and the Shan and the Rakhine and the, the different ethnic communities to, to participate in the process of government. And so integrating not only the Rohingya and, and being able to talk about, you know, these kind of conflicts in, in a way that is open and democratic is really a fundamental part of, of creating their new society. And, and looking at that as an informational problem, uh, to me, is, is kind of one of those fundamental issues that you want to get at, you know, with our program in some small way, but more broadly, as, as a society, they're going to have to address just as much as the kind of economic and political questions that people usually talk about. So I, I think it's becoming more important than ever today. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, 
you know, academics have, many academics have embraced social media to market themselves. So you definitely see that they have their own, you know, WordPress and um, they share their articles on Facebook and they use academia.edu or ResearchGate and, you know, even though at times they've gotten into trouble because they are going against copyright. So, but the issue here is they only, they, they're still working from the old format because the knowledge is still written in a journal format for other academics and it's not being disseminated in ways which make sense to the common public, particularly often the demographic that maybe you're catering to uh, communities that don't get that kind of language or not engaged, you want to engage the youth or maybe the elderly or people who are not academically inclined, which is a majority of society, right? So I think in some sense, yes, they're using social media, but when it comes to transforming the very content into ways which can be engaging, often they don't have the skill set, they're not thinking in those ways, or they believe that it was almost de-intellectualize it if they popularize it. And that to me is really a serious issue, is popularism is looked, I mean, po being popular is looked upon as anti-intellectual. And uh, so, you know, but there are some very interesting experiments. For example, um, you know, I, I saw wonderful, uh, uh, you know, work in, in New York. I recently went for a digital labor conference where an educator wanted it, was doing this fantastic research on what, what is poverty in New York. I mean, it seems so basic a question, but how is it? And she got people, the participants, to talk in the Skype camera and just talk about what does poverty mean to them. And she had this installation, uh, because she happened to be an artist, of just voices of poverty in this time and age, right? And it was more groundbreaking than reading any kind of book. You would just, you, yeah, it really communicated way to very visceral. And um, so I think this is a gave me an idea. So actually, our team, a third of them are artists. And I really believe academics and artists together make a wonderful combination. And activists, too. So the activists keep it real and they like say, oh, but what does this really mean, you know? And the artists are like, oh, this is so boring. Let's do something different. And then academics are like, yeah, but is this you know, uh, authentic to the idea and are we being true to it. So I think they make a very good team together. So I think that is something we're heading in this direction and I would really like, uh, this is going to be my future pet project that uh, the more academics on board, the better, I think, to come on board, get, summarize and, you know, sort of create a synopsis of what's your intellectual output and then working with artists, students, to communicate and convert it and coming up with an educative channel. It's really actually simple and frankly it's, we don't need to, what disturbs me is like I said, is uh, obviously there's money behind it because a lot of publishing companies are seeing the value in non-textual, you know, information literacy and they want a model, but, and they, they're making it into a business model, so we really need to make this free and accessible to the public, right? So yeah, it's a it's a team effort. Yeah. I have a question that I'll start with Dan and then Kyle. So uh, I really liked the way I thought you framed really nicely the different kinds of literacies that you said you can do at right? That is like did you get the nice line? That's yeah, your opinion. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. I, okay, sorry. Yeah. For your and um, so I thought that was really interesting because it explicitly talks about these all these terms and what they mean. And then there's kind of this interesting catch-22, right? Because you have outsiders coming in with their framework about what literacy is about, which is super important in a context where literacy has been robbed, right? right? But there's a bit of a catch-22, right? Because it's an outside, you know, traditionally a, a, a problem has been when you've had outsiders come in and they've imposed ideas on sort of country. So I'm curious. So it's kind of a double question. One is I'm curious, how are you navigating that so that it's empowering for the people that, with whom you're working with and also that the concept perhaps concepts of literacy we can learn what well, yeah the the, 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 the double the other one was that you said that these concepts of literacies are often developed in a different concept but we're using those concepts in a place where it's not making sense so how does that mesh and how is it how is that evolving so maybe we can learn about literacies in this new concept and think in a different way 
And it also makes me think of Brazil, right? Like when I think of, and politically, and when I think of literacy in Brazil, especially during the dictatorship, you can't help but you think Paulo Freire, right? Which is a very politicized version of, of literacy. So I'm wondering if there was a, a Paulo Freire movement or something like this that was happening um, in the context where you did research. So I'll start with it and then I'll ask one more question. Yeah, it's um, it's really challenging to 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 think about it in in that specific context, and I think we really you know did try try to think actively about how to build our program um, in a way that allowed our partners there to to take an equal role in, in developing the curriculum and addressing these ideas. Um, but at the same time, um, we were trying to find you know something to kind of build a, a framework around that that got to core principles um, that, that could work in any context if they were modified in the right way. Um, and, and that's, I think, why we did settle on the, the European Union framework, um, because the kind of core competencies that, that you get at, I can kind of, I think this is still on. I kind of wanted to show you this, but it's a little more technical. Um, but it, it does, I think it really does kind of frame what we were looking at as a, as a problem. Um, and I mentioned these earlier. Um, but the, these are the, the different aspects, the different kind of, these are the, you know, the areas, the competency areas I mentioned, right? Information, communication, content creation, safety, problem solving. Um, but that these are, you know, the different components of that, the, co the core competencies that you get at in each of those areas. And you know, looking at these kind of different specific examples, yes, there will be you know different competencies that are applicable to different contexts. But I would say almost universally, these are the kind of ideas and competencies, uh, literacy components that you want to get at when you're addressing these concepts. You want to do it in different ways depending on the context, but you still want to make sure that whether you're a Brazilian or an American or a Burmese that you're able to search for information effectively. Um, that you know, you're able to develop a, a concept of what netiquette is, of, of what etiquette is, e e efficacy is online. But that will be different in different contexts, right? And you want to allow people to develop ways of, of teaching people about these concepts in their own way and, and teaching, teaching them about how to address them in different ways with, with, with the literacy curriculum that they develop themselves. Um, so it's translating these core ideas in the different ways uh, that, that I think is really where you get that value added. You allow people to enter into a conversation about you know, how to build that literacy in different ways and how to address those specific aspects, right? You have a very wide range of competencies here that get at different skills, right? Programming is like a technical, like an ICT literacy concept, right? But then like, you know, Engaging in online citizenship is, is more of almost yeah, an, an information literacy concept. Being able to, to evaluate information, right? That's like a media literacy concept, right? And, and so I think, you know, what I came, came around to and what I think the group came around to is that this was the best description that, that works in a universal way that we can then go and work with our partners to, to modify in different ways to get these concepts in, in new in enlightening ways, but yeah, I think that's really, that, that's where the interesting part comes in, right, is that you wouldn't just design, you know, a set of exercises and, and try and throw them and just translate them into different languages and throw them at people, you know, you want to engage with your li local librarian or your, you know, NGO worker who knows his audience and knows, you know, who she's working with and, and to be able to say, well, who are you working with in this village? What do they need to, to know? What do they want to know? And, and what, what can you provide to them? And, and how do you translate these kind of core concepts into something that they'll understand, but also that they'll be able to use and apply in their everyday lives? That's, that's really what we're trying to get at. And we did our best to try and translate those, those concepts in different ways. Um, so I know this is not the, the goal of um, Caleb's labs, but I can't help but thinking about questions of value and how that how that's negotiated in this space. Because as you said, that the businesses, I mean, you know, it's, it's a bottom line. It's traditionally an economic bottom line, right? And so that's what's 
driving traditional businesses and academia's information and knowledge development and industry. And I'm just curious if there's been clashes or how you navigate these different values or if values you're trying to keep it neutral, which I really question whether you can, um, how are you navigating these different worlds in this, in this experiment and project? Yeah, I, I think that's, um, well, let's say because it's, it's experimental, it's definitely something which every project brings its own challenges. So it's not like, oh, once you've learned with one company, then that's it, and then the next one is we can replicate it. So um, it is true that we have to watch for how we go about But what surprised me was actually the risk-averse nature by co corporations themselves, because often it comes from public relations who are extremely risk averse. I mean, their form of communicating to the public is through a press release. They're like lawyers. They don't, they don't, sorry. <laughs> so, so they're very, very careful. So the last thing they want is to appear like they're trying to market. And so actually that surprised me. That was a big wake up call because we would have been very enthusiastic about projects, but often it was like about certain tweets and we would always run it by the Dutch brewer's director and he would slash it, no, that sounds like marketing, no, this sounds like they could accuse us of doing, oh, these NGO groups are going to attack us for this. And I wouldn't see that. And I was thinking, wow, these guys are tuned in to not provoking the public. So, and like I said, so they, what they've done is, because of the risk of us nation, they just shut down, mm -hmm. right? And GE also, they do many press releases. So again, this, and that is for them, in fact, they are waking up to this, they are wondering, should PR be radically transforming? Because maybe it's time public relations as a field needs to radically transform. We can't just put it on our website saying, this is what we think, and you know, okay, tough, right? Uh, because that protects them, but that doesn't have any kind of communication. So. Um, that was actually the contrary to what, uh, it was very frustrating actually to, for students, uh, I, actually our team was going crazy because they are like, oh but we thought, we, I mean we are academics, we were being careful and now you're telling us, you know, that it's like a nuanced language, that like, sometimes they made it so boring and that actually that was a challenge. They wanted to really explain and we are like, this is Twitter, you, you can't, write an essay about this tweet. This is, and also we're like, look, it's supposed to be engaging. They're like, no, no, uh, we should make it more descriptive. They're like, no, it's provocative, especially like the hidden camera. They're meant to click on it, of course it's going to be clarified. Even that was very nerve-wracking for them. So that, I think, is a negotiable because the problem with the attention economy is you use these tactics to get the attention, but create legitimacy once they're on that platform. So yeah, that was a trade-off. Um, but uh, it was actually the reverse, which is interesting. So it, it really is where, in which department you're dealing with, and often it's the public relations departments in these companies that are most interested in changing the game. And I think there's something to be said about what's going to happen with PR in the years to come. It really is transforming. So. Next questions? Are you good for the um, snacks and one <laughs> one questions? Okay. So, um, thank you very much for coming. Let me do some merchandising. We have a new fellow that we'll present tomorrow. We have Florian. Anyone? Just that. Yes. Just that. <laughs> Just that. <laughs> the new project. And Gemma. Um, tomorrow we have a second session of the fellows. Um, Very different. Uh, Very different. Completely different. Yes. If it was the reverse, we would say the same thing. Completely different. <laughs> um, uh, so that floor is open for conversations and kids and things like that. Thank you very much for coming.